Uh, the subject for the morning has been an object of considerable controversy. And uh, back in the old medieval periods, there were very elaborate works dealing with magic. Uh, magic, uh, sometimes uncertain, often unsavory in those days. Dark circles at the crossroads, haunts, various forms of black magic. All these finally gathered together under the general term of the astral light. The word itself, of course, is a perfectly innocent word. It really means, essentially, the effects of the stars. The, the convergence of star energies upon the atmosphere of the earth. We have a feeling of what they do when they affect us uh, by its astrology and by weather and by numerous meteorological reports. We are informed, at least in part, of starry influences. But the effect of these influences upon the Earth's subtle atmospheres became the basis of an elaborate structure in magical thinking. First of all, we have to follow the general pattern of antiquity in the discussion of the planet itself. We think of the planet Earth as merely as a sign of balls surrounded by some atmosphere and floating in a great sea of space. This is not the way the ancients looked at it. They considered the planet to be based upon the same general pattern as the human being himself. Man has a physical body and he has invisible principles operating through it. To the ancients, the earth had invisible principles. The earth was not merely a lump. The earth was an organized structure, a structure that was capable of supporting life and passing through innumerable vicissitudes and changes of itself. There was not only a visible earth, but an invisible one. There was not only a physical earth, but there was a superphysical one. And the invisible structures of the earth like the aura of the human body, were energy fields. And these energy fields were involved in the evolution of everything that exists in nature. All the kingdoms of life are nourished by the energies from appropriate levels of the energy fields. A large part of magnetic healing is the result of energies being directed, either by human consciousness or by various medicinal substances which carry these energies. Therefore, the whole planet is a vast organism, a tremendous vital dynamic structure, of which we in our daily living see only the outside and the surface. Beneath the surface is not just simply vast strata, strata of rocks and volcanic forces. The invisible part of the earth is a tremendous being, or as the ancients put it, the earth is alive. The earth is a living thing. It is not simply a, a body or an object. Everything that exists in some way or other is alive. There is no death in space, but constant transformation. So the earth itself was a being. And in the mythology of the ancients, they had appropriate deities to symbolize not only the earth, but all of the separate parts of the earth's structure. The earth has its own mind, its own emotions, its own vitality. It not only is able to support life, but it is able to direct life. It not only brings us all the different forms of energy and life which we know in daily living, but it is behind this a conscious, rational power. Now, uh, most people today, of course, don't believe this. Uh, science has taken the attitude that man had the mind and the rest of nature was in existence only for man to tamper with. But this is not the way antiquity viewed it. Uh, the uh, ancients were convinced that there was a tremendous vital power behind the physical form. Researches on the magnetic field of the human being have justified the realization that man also is both visible and invisible. The invisible part of man is sidereal. It is an energy field. It has its own memory. It has its own records. It has its own morality and ethics. 
And when the human being with his mind transgresses the ethics of the magnetic field, he gets sick. Because everything in nature is constantly laboring towards an equilibrium, which will keep things as nearly in order as possible. So we look at the earth now as a kind of world with many levels. The Egyptians did the same thing. In the old tombs there are still old diagrams showing the levels of the planet and of the solar system and of all the invisible beings that dwell therein. The Tibetans and Buddhists had the seven heavens and so did the Christians in the apocalypse. All of these mysteries are now counted as merely aberrations. Well, some of them probably are aberrations, but what is an admiration? What is it that causes the individual to create fantasy? What is it that causes him to emotionalize every fact of his living? There has to be an emotional energy or he cannot do it. There has to be a mental energy or he cannot think. There has to be a vital energy or the body could, be, could not be repaired in case of sickness and the growth of the child would be impossible. So everywhere there is life behind the scenes. Now as soon as man began to recognize the possibility of life behind the scenes, he wanted to get to look at it, to find out about it, to do something with it. He was not content simply to live in a mystery. So he went to work, but unfortunately he was not well equipped for the job. The energies which he was seeking to understand were also in himself, but he had never done anything with them in himself. He had never attempted to organize his own life and bring it in harmony with the universal purpose. He was determined to take this universal purpose and force it into harmony with his own purposes. So there was a conflict here, and out of this conflict, magic was one of the byproducts. It was one of the experimental structures in which the individual was attempting to understand the energies around him, moving through him, and variously conditioning him. Among other things, he discovered that his mind could control not only visible and physical thoughts, but invisible thoughts. The mind of the individual could create thoughts. And where are thoughts? What are they? How are they born? Do they live? How do they die? Here is something that we pass over. We don't even try to explain these things. We say we had an idea one morning. Where did it come from? Was it any good? How do we know that it came from us? Did we borrow it from somebody else? And is this idea useful or useless? Is it constructive or perverse? Is it is helping something or hurting something? These problems we have no way of estimating except through the old esoteric doctrines that have descended to us from uh, minds such as Paracelsus and Pythagoras. The ancients definitely believed that the individual had a field of energy around him which could and did affect his life, that he also could poison this field with his own thinking, that he could destroy himself, and that phenomena such as drug addiction and alcoholism are aspects of the perversion of energies, that they are the sickening of the field of the imagination that surrounds the body. So we have a problem that goes back to the dawn of time as to what is imagination, how does it work, and is there a solid structure there, and how can we direct it, or how does it direct us? All this was part of ceremonial magic, became involved in the Kabbalah, and has more lately taken its place in metaphysical psychology. All of these elements, therefore, uh, must be brought down to some level where we can use them, where we can find out what they're doing to us or what we are doing to them. At the present moment, the astral light is largely the product of what we have done to it. This field is a kind of field of the ghost world. It is the field of the invisible, but in a sense bound to the visible form of life. The uh, Egyptians knew this ghost or phantom world. They also equated it with sleep and dreams and uh, believed in many cases, and perhaps correctly, that the dream life of the individual is not a mere fantasy. 
it is a fantasizing of something else. Anyway, we find in modern thinking there has come out of it all a kind of concept of magic. The magic of accomplishing certain purposes by dramatic intensities of the will. With magic also has come an absolutely unnecessary correlative, and that is ritual. Now, the Indian on the reservation here in the Southwest is a good example of a primitive magic lingering on through time. An Indian finds a little pebble. It is a nice little pebble. He puts it away to keep, but the pebble is still a pebble. But later he finds another pebble, which he likes, and he puts it side by side with the first one. He likes the combination, so he ties a thread around it and put a feather in one end, and it isn't two little rocks anymore. It is now a fetish. Now, a fetish is something that uh, has magic power, a combination of things that is not ordinary. Things in their ordinary states are not fetishes, but when they are put into an extraordinary relationship with themselves or each other, then they gain magical influence. And the two little stones that would have done nothing in their natural state suddenly may have the power of life and death in the mind of the Indian who has created a fetish from them. This is another aspect of the same thing as the so-called ghost and dance and mask rites of ancient peoples. We have an exhibit in the library here now of the sacred masks of the Southwest American Indians. The Indian is perfectly aware of the fact that the mask is made by himself. He is perfectly aware of the fact that when he is wearing it, he is still himself. But when he combines the mask with himself, something happens. While he is wearing this mask, the astral light has stepped into his consciousness. Magic. He is no longer simply a member of the tribe. He is now some kind of a strange being conjured up by sorcery, conjured up by imagination, by ritual, rite, and symbol. Therefore, yeah, the Indian, I've been up to where they put these dances on once a year, and uh, a young Indian, for instance, with a mask, will be approached by his own family, his wife, his mother. But if where he is wearing the mask, they will pray to him as a god. The moment he takes it off, he's back on earth. But in the, in the, mid, the midst of ritual, of magic, of transformation, something happens. Alephus Levy, the French transcendentalist, says that these things are creatures of the astral light. There is something that is not really imaginary, and yet is. Something that gains a new dimension. In spite of the strange fantasy of it, we realize that this type of thing has been in religion since the beginning. One of the most common forms of this in religion is the relic, something that belonged to a, a venerated person, something that has healing power because it belonged at one time to the body of a saint or something of this nature. These things are extensions. And like the, the uh, healings of uh, various Christian mystical shrines, uh, like St. Anne de Bonpré in Canada, or Lourdes, this place is magical. It is magic because a strange story has been built up around it. This story transforms the commonplace into magic. Magic of ritual, mad magic of sacred accounts, legends, lore, and all these things suddenly transform objects of common usage into things extremely uncommon, things possessing strange and secret powers. And where do these powers come from? In a sense, they must come from believing. If you did not believe in them, they would not exist. But what is it in the person that by believing can change his entire life? What is it that when an individual, for instance, is converted to a religion, that this conversion in words, laying on of hands, or some, some symbolical ritual, suddenly transforms him. He has ceased to begin be a sinner and is becoming a saint. Some strange healing takes place from a source difficult to analyze. All these different mysteries seem to belong to an invisible realm that is very close to us, and which under certain conditions becomes available to us 
a realm which perhaps we contact in sleep, in dreams, in uh, night, nightmares, in trances, and under psychic pressures as uh, through a medium or something of this nature. There is some mysterious contact which suddenly changes the commonplace that makes us believe things that in our more sober moments we would not believe. But whether they are sober not moments or not, when they happen, even the skeptic is profoundly influenced. There is something around us that the ancients knew that changed things. And uh, this probably came originally from the belief that the spirits of the ancestors remain close and that the old tribal chief who had passed on still guarded his tribe. He also got unhappy if the tribe broke the rules. If they did something they shouldn't do, the old spirit haunts them, and they have to placate it by making offerings, prayers, ceremonies, and doing various things to counteract the disfavor that has arisen between themselves and their patron deities. So all the great pantheon of deities propitiated by rites and ceremonies and rituals are very, this is all very hard to explain, but beyond it all, and in spite of our uncertainties, it works. Something happens. And it is this something that happens that has been the subject of most ceremonial magic. That the commonplace under uncommon circumstances gains a new dimension of power. And that this power is available, that this power does operate, and that this power can profoundly influence the individual. Now there comes another point in this, is that to determine the degree of the power and to determine the way or means of the influence. To begin with, the influence arises from believing. Believing is something which leaves a person open to the unfamiliar and also makes possible the miracle. Without believing, the miracle is virtually impossible. But with believing, faith, and trust, with belief that it is possible, miracles of incredible proportions have occurred. There is no doubt in the world that there is a means or power by which the individual can attract certain forces or circumstances out of the strange mystery of the inner worlds which he inhabits. So we have to come now to the consideration of this structure of magic and how it really came into existence. I think we must, first of all, determine that behind the physical world there is a world of energies and that these energies are stratified. That behind the physical body is an etheric energy, a kind of ether which permeates the body, and that much of difficulty and sickness and sorrow and misery result from the defects which arise in the ether. The etheric body is attached to the physical body, largely in the area of the spleen, and the physical body is constantly energized from a certain definite structure. In other words, the energy that comes into the body of the individual is supposed to arise primarily from nutrition, from uh, air, and from sidereal influences of one kind or another. Influences can also be communicated from one person to another. And an individual highly venerated has a much stronger effect upon others than one who is not so venerated. So all around us, believing is releasing, changing, moving energies. It is conditioning them for good or for bad. It is conditioning the bad conscience to face the probabilities of punishment. It is conditioning the dedicated mystic to the realization that sometime he will have all the answers to the questions that he asks. Everywhere, a kind of mystical sympathy exists between things. And this mystical energy also relates to deity, for the most extreme and abstract of all problems is God. And God is the source of all life, and the universe is the structure through which this life is disseminated. Therefore, somewhere, whether we see it or not, is a great arterial system of energies, 
these energies moving from one level of, of application to another. One stream of energy feeds the trees and another one feeds the flowers. Everywhere, however, energy is supporting all things that live. Yet the energy apart from something that lives is definitely impossible to define. Energy can only be known by what it does. Energy can only be assumed to be real because without it, many questions could not be answered. So we have an energy field of life. This energy field is part of the health of each person. The energy disseminating through the body moves through all of the circulatory system. Some of this energy is in the tiniest cell or atom. Part of this energy gives us the power to think. Another part gives us the power to walk. All this energy of some kind is real. Now, we have long assumed, for example, that uh, the body just takes care of itself. and If we feed it regularly, it'll take care of us. This is a complete lack of understanding, and it has very serious consequences because it prevents us from cooperating consciously and intelligently with the energies which do supply us the necessary elements of health and survival. Therefore, somewhere in this pattern, there is an energy, a sea of it, a great ocean of it, which like air itself, which may be its principal carrier, that fills all of these vacancies of space, exists in every creature, shares its reality and its power with the horse and the tiniest insect. Everything is supported and is alive because of a life principle in it. And this life principle is not sustained by food. It is not sustained by exercise. But its condition and its ability to function is largely influenced by the conduct of the creature that it inhabits. That this energy is universal, not only in its a dis dissemination, but in the infinite variation and variety of modes and forms. Therefore, it is indeed a kind of protean life that takes any appearance that exists. It can be found in the anthill or it can be found in the elephant. Everything that lives, lives off of this energy, and in everything this energy is exactly adapted to the needs of that thing. The answer seems to be that in one way or another the energy is what fashioned that thing in the beginning. Because every physical visible force is merely a manifestation of one of these great invisible streams of energy that functions in space. So if we start looking into this, we begin to say how the ancients could have imagined and did imagine that this world that we don't see the world in which we are constantly pouring things and having them poured back at us out of this strange atmosphere. One of the most common problems, of course, is imagination. Is there anything that a human being can imagine that could not exist? This has been a great question. Is imagination capable of creating life or creating things? Or is it merely a transformer? Is it merely a way in which energy of another type is steered or c conditioned into a pattern we have created with our own thinking? Now, I think in fantasy we have this fairly well figured. We find healers, and spiritual healing is distinctly a possibility. We find that magnetic healing is accomplished by opening up the locked areas of distribution of energy through the body. All death in form is the result of obstruction. Energy breaks up obstruction. If energy fails, obstruction takes over. So healing of various kinds of a religious nature certainly does exist. Now, of course, the many moments you say that, you place yourself in the problem of magic. If you study this and you realize that you have been to a healer of good reputation and that you have had constructive results, the question now remains is, why and how did you get these results? Did the healer actually give you a kind of healing that was separate from your own consciousness? 
with its superior and absolute like a medication, something that is given to you? Or was the healing a stimulation of your own internal resources? It is probably a little of both. It is a little of both because under a belief we are capable of accomplishing a great deal. This is well po pointed out in Oriental philosophy in the phenomenon of Zen, where the entire dis development of the individual arises from the complete conditioning of his own psychic integration. Now, if it is this, if it is the individual who is healing himself, then he is healing himself by releasing energy. He has broken up an obstruction. Now, if we uh, go up to another level of energy, we can take mental energy. An individual who has a new idea or learns something will have the power to break up the obstruction of a previous error. If he discovers he was wrong in something and by discovery gets a remedy, then he breaks up the error pattern in himself. And how did the error pattern get into him? It came because he himself put it there through an erroneous attitude or by believing something that was not true. So the correction and the ailment are tied together by one great factor alone, and that, well, and that is energy. Energy which permits all changes and transformations to occur. Energy which changes the moral life of everything, results in the evolution of species, results also in the mysterious worlds of space around us. Energy, then, is a factor in all magic. It is life. It is something that can be steered. Now, there are two ways of steering it. One is the individual trying to adapt it to his own needs, and the other is a universal power adapting or adopting energy to its purposes through living things. Therefore, there is an energy that arises directly from deity, and there is an energy that arises from deity but is distributed through forms, including the human being. And this is represented by the, in the ancient formula by the fact that there are rays that go directly from the sun to the earth and from the earth into man. There are also rays that go directly from the sun to the moon and then are uh, carried across to man from the lunar orb, even though it is dead, so-called. There is no thing actually dead. But the energy field of the moon is very slow in comparison to that of a live planet. So all these different things are happening in space, and in the midst of these rises the magician, the, the uh, person trying to use magic, magic being the adaptation of energy, the application of it to other forms than that which is most commonly assigned to it, the energy factor that says all things are possible, the energy that takes the poor boy into the great scientist, or takes the comparatively self-centered individual and makes out of him an, an economic giant. These things are all energy. Without the energy, he couldn't accomplish anything. But with the energy, he has something that adapts itself to the shape or purpose of himself. But there are laws governing this energy, and the individual does not normally know what these laws are. Therefore, he assumes that energy can be used as he pleases. And if he discovers new ways to use it, he is that more fortunate. Actually, however, energy is conditioned, limited, restricted, and specialized, just as every other element in nature. So the individual who uses energy for magical means uh, came finally to become considered under two headings ceremonial or divine magic, and negative or black magic. White magic was the use of all energies for the good of all that lives. Therefore, white magic is the unselfish application of, <coughs> of energies. Black magic is selfishness. Black magic is the use of uh, understanding, wisdom, uh, knowledge of secret matters by means of which an individual can impose a tyranny upon someone else. So the use of energy has its own price, its own expense. 
its own bill that will be definitely brought to bear on the subject. In the problem of energy, then, now we'll go into a kind of an Egyptian phase of this, and we see the individual in a world of shadow forms. Uh, we have a t uh, term here, symbol, and there is an ancient art of symbolism. Now, a symbol is a picture of a motive or an idea or a meaning. It is putting a mysterious truth into the form of a picture. And this is also the same thing that happens in the case of the astral light. All action, all attitude, all feeling can be considered as pictorial. Everything that exists has a shape of some kind. Some of these shapes we can see around us in daily life. Some of these shapes impose themselves upon us in sleep as dreams and nightmares. Some of these shapes never appear to the physical world at all. Others are particularly limited to the abilities of psychics. But in every instance, every single thought or emotion has a picture, has a likeness of itself, a mathematical pattern, a geometrical balanced design which stands for it. All the symmetrical patterns are related to good or constructive things, asymmetrical to evil. All things that are good are beautiful. All things that are bad are ultimately hideous. We therefore always represent evil beings as monsters of one kind or another. And we are a little closer than we realize to the symbolism, because all evil is monstrous. All things which are destructive look destructive if the psychic or the clairvoyant has the capability of seeing them. Therefore, in the Egyptian philosophy, the world of the afterlife is filled with symbols. Symbols that have been brought into existence here. Symbols that represent conduct, codes of action, ways of doing things. And in the human being at the time of death, there is a ka, a particular level of being, which contains or epitomizes these emblems so that the ghost of the individual going into this other dimension takes on the appearance of its true nature rather than the appearance of the person that, uh, and how they looked in this world. Consequently, the evil person slowly becomes symbolical of, a, of an evil arrangement of things. An evil picture, an evil monstrosity appears, which has no real existence as a monster but is simply a true picture of the behavior of a living person now deceased. This living person, therefore, now deceased, remains either approximately human, going on until the re-embodiment, or it goes through a process of re renovation, to the Egyptians at least. They believe that this ghost-like thing represented a level of the being, a kind of shadow, a symbol, an emblem. And in the afterlife, the individual remains for a time identified with this. Finally, the true person departs from the emblem, having overcome it through experience and through greater understanding, and ascends, and the ghost monster slowly disintegrates and into a kind of inferno in which there is no longer any life in it. The Egyptians and Greeks, however, believe that occasionally these ghosts were taken on by entities that are not human or might have been at some time and therefore become obsessing or possessing spirits. And in black magic, like the case of Dr. Faust, we hear that ultimately his devil took him and uh, Faust was forced to face the consequences of his own evil deeds. Actually, though, the actual procedure while it is symbolized in the diagrams of Tibet, where we find all kinds of beings, divine and monstrous, they are all parts of this vision period of the astral light. They are parts of things that are not essentially true, but are non-essentially present due to the complications of rational thinking or emotion. If, therefore, the individual uh, having negative attitudes wishes to, in one way or another, misuse the psychic energies, 
or misuse the other forms of etheric vitality which they need to live with. If this happens, then trouble is bound to happen as a consequence. There has to be a, a, a negative reaction. And this we find where in, uh, in Europe there's museums, there are numbers of pacts signed between uh, human beings and, and demons. These pacts for the world that the demon should serve the human being, as in the case of Faust, for a certain number of t years, after which the human person gave his soul to the evil one as compensation or as a payment of this debt. Uh, this type of thinking, of course, is not exactly possible of rationalization, but it does indicate that the individual believes that if he gains through evil some profit, some security or success, he is ultimately going to pay for it. That the evil which he uses for his own benefit will sometime turn on him and punish him. So all of these mysterious energy levels have a high ethical standing. They permit no misuse of any natural force or combination or pattern of forces without, without consequential punishment. So we have all this to think about, and then we come right on down to a little bit into our modern way of life and see what, what we can think through uh, on this particular level. Being surrounded by energies that we need to live, we now begin to realize, simply in uh, eugenics and hygienics, that these energies must be conserved and that our various attitudes in life must be correct or in some way or another we are going to get into trouble. We are in trouble one way at the present time, particularly in the narcotics problem. As far as the scientist and social worker is concerned, the narcotic addict is simply an individual with a weak disposition uh, who has formed a destructive habit which will ultimately destroy him. This is, however, not exactly the whole story. In the old days, it would have been taken for granted that uh, this type of thing is one way of selling the soul to evil. In other words, the individual who in weakness or in uh, indifference uh, destroys or damages his own body uh, creates an attraction and the very habit-forming quality uh, which he has become addicted to, cocaine.